I'm so very happy to be invited once again to be present with you to celebrate and commemorate the life and times of Mwalimu Julius Kambara Genyerere. I first came to Tanzania as a student on the ninth day of December 1984 when I was a student leader at the University of Nairobi and the then president of Kenya invited me among other students to accompany him and that is when I met Mwalimu Nyerere. I then 10 years later in 1994 visited at the invitation of Professor Haru Bothman on the occasion of 40 years of celebration of leadership in Africa and that is when I formally was introduced to Mwalimu Julius Kambara Genyerere and his foundation. It therefore gladdens my heart that I'm in the country of a man whom I admire and in a hall named after and in a hall that is named after another great African, the Osagiefo, Dr. Kwame Nukuruma. The subject that has preoccupied us in the last few days is one that is as topical as it is relevant. The rise or fall of Africa on account of the African politician. And in order to do justice to that subject and to remain faithful to my chosen subject, which is a call for hygiene in African politics, there is a sense in which one must take a historical journey, if only to appreciate the factors that animated Africans to seek to regain their independence from the colonial masters. Historians will remind us that we were first enslaved, that Africans were taken, and this we seldom say, the first civilization to take Africans out of this continent were the Arabs. And they took Africans from the eastern coast, and it's sad that in that part of the world there are not many Africans who remained because it was in the business of the Arab enslaver to castrate Africans. We never say that, but we must say it because it is historically significant. Then the Europeans came, the Portuguese came, the Spaniards came, the Germans came, the French came, the Belgians came. Africa became the hunting ground for the European colonizers. And we were the spot. We built, our ancestors built the United States of America. Our ancestors built Europe. And when Slavery had lost its shine and sheen. The Europeans abolished it. But they replaced it with yet another pernicious enterprise. The colonization of Africa. The Europeans sat in Berlin, in Germany, in 1884. And they looked at the map of Africa and puzzled it out. The British had their share, the Germans had their share, and Tanzania or Tanganyika was their share, as was Rwanda and Urundi. The Spaniards were Johnny come lately in the arena, and they got little Equatorial Guinea and Southwest Africa. The French were here, the Portuguese were here. And we were colonized. This time round, they did not take us away. They came here and they controlled us. 
And they told us, not in so many words, that we were children of a lesser God. And we were treated as if we were children of a lesser God. In fact, they told us that on the day of creation, we were merely hewers of wood and drawers of water. And if anybody were to doubt it in 1948, it was more blatant when Hendrik Fafut instituted the apartheid regime in South Africa. But yet there is a sense in which the God that we worship never sleeps. The colonial enterprise ran its course. And the European tribes, the Europeans never called themselves tribes, they called them nations, were engaged in a war. First in 1918, the European tribes fought. And they had something called the League of Nations, which died. Then they fought again in 1945. And what is unique about the European nations is that when they are engaged in tribal wars, they call them world wars. So there was another war between 1945, 1939 and 1945. And after that, a new kid on the block, the United States of America, took the lead in saying that colonialism was something that was undesirable. But at that time, Africans were never quiet. Those who had been taken out had already started agitating. Many of us here will remember Marcus Garvey, of whom Bob Marley says, Garvey was a buffalo soldier in the heart of America. And many of us will remember W.E.B. Du Bois. Many of us will remember that they started agitating that Africans must regain their dignity and their independence. And indeed, in 1847, in Liberia, a small group of Africans were brought back in Monrovia, and Liberia became the first independent black nation in the continent of Africa. So soon thereafter in Sierra Leone, they also created yet another colony. But Africa was colonized, except Ethiopia, which they tried to take in 1938 and exiled Professor Dr. Hale Selassie. And unfortunately, they were defeated, as you remember, in the Battle of Adowa. Africa can defeat European tribes. This history is necessary that we are able to appreciate the freedom that we gained. So that Gavi came, W.E.B. Du Bois came, but there was another crop after the 1940s who had had the advantage of European education. And there were people in Europe also who are beginning to recognize that indeed equality was necessary. And this was not anything new. In 1776 in the United States of America, the American states sitting in Philadelphia in the United States of America declared unto themselves that all men are born equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. A few years later in France, after the revolution, they also recognized that we were to be equal so that the colonized nations which had now taken Africans thought that they were safe. They had taken Leopold Sedar Senghor from Senegal to Paris and they thought that they were creating a little Frenchman. Little did they know that they were creating somebody who would want to overthrow them. They took Félix Houphé Boigny from Côte d'Ivoire and they thought that they were creating somebody who would be subservient to them. They took Ahmed Sekoture and Modibo Keita, and they thought they were safe. 
Little did they know that they were creating the future leaders and agitators against French colonization. And he did not stop there. The Portuguese also took Agostino Neto and Amilcar Cabral and Eduardo Monlein to Lisbon. Little did they know that those individuals would be the catalyst that would be necessary in the process of decolonization. The British also had their fair share. They took others, they took Mwalimu Kambarage Nyerere, Hastings Kamuzu Banda, Kenneth David Kaunda and many others to the United Kingdom, Jomo Kenyatta. Little did they know that those would be the individuals who sometimes later and in Ghana, of course, they took the Osagiefo, Kwame Nukuruma, and in Nigeria, they took Dr. Namdi Azikiwe, Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, and Saha Madu Bello, the Sultana of Sokot. There is a sense, therefore, in which these individuals started recognizing that having been enslaved, having been colonized, we now had to liberate ourselves. And the agitation started. And Kwame Nukuruma and his Ghana acquired independence in 1957. And I still can hear Kwame Nukuruma through the vicissitudes of time saying in Accra, Ghana, that Ghana is free and will never be colonized again. But the freedom of Ghana means nothing if the rest of Africa is not free. I can hear, I can hear Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere saying that he's prepared to delay the independence of Tanganyika so that Tanganyika, Kenya, Uganda would become independent at one time. Mwalimu could see the future with the exactitude of a Jewish prophet, Jomo Kenyatta and Obote could not. And therefore, we gained independence as separate states and the story will be told shortly. So what do we see? The agitation, the demand by the people that we must de be decolonized. And why is it that we were asking that we must be decolonized? Why is it that we were demanding that we must regain our independence? Because throughout the ages, it was always the divine plan that men must be masters of their destiny. And when we gained our independence, the leaders of the day were eloquent as they were clear that the reason why we were asking to be independent is because we wanted to take charge of our affairs. We wanted to be the governors. We wanted to have our young men and women acquire education. We wanted to control the production of our food through agriculture. We wanted to build our infrastructure. We wanted to improve, improve the quality of the lives of our people by improving their health. We wanted to eliminate poverty. We were clear on what we wanted and this message was as clear in West Africa as it was clear in East Africa, as it was clear in Central Africa, as it was clear in Northern Africa. So that if you listen to Kwame Nukuruma, it's as if you'd listen to Agostino Nato. And if you listen to Nato, it's as if you'd listen to Samora Moses Marshall. And if you listen to Ahmed Ben Bella in the Maghreb, it's as if you'd listen to Patrice Emery Lumumba. There is a sense in which there was unanimity that this was the only way and we attained independence. And I remember so very vividly in 1957 in Casablanca, Morocco, was it in 1960, when the then eight independent African countries met on the Osagia for Kwame Nukuruma was clear that we must ensure that everybody else regains their independence and that we must remember that the colonial master is not asleep and that if we don't unite, he'll come under other guises through the neo-colonial project, but they listened to Kwame Nukuruma not. And even before they assembled in 1963, in the month of May in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, 
No sooner had countries started attaining independence than the colonial pro neo-colonial project started taking root. And in 1960, the first coup d'etat and assassination took place in Togo when Silvanus Olympio was eliminated. One year later, Patrice Emery Lumumba was eliminated. So that in 1963, in the month of May, when 32 heads of states and government assembled in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, there were several speeches, but three speeches stand out. Kwame Nukuruma's speech, Mwalimu Kambara Genyerere's speech, and Emperor Hail Selassie's speech. Hail Selassie was the host. And his in all, in all inimitable style, he reminded the congregation who are present in Africa Hall in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, that that was a momentous occasion and that the long-term health of Africa not only required but demanded that Africa must pull in the same direction, Hail Silasi said. And Mwalimu took the baton from Hail Silasi and repeated the same words, celebrating the fact that we were independent and we had the opportunity of determining in our affairs. But the greatest of the speeches was that of the Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma. Kwame Nukuruma had a sense of urgency which everybody else did not have. He said, not in so many words, but in effect, that if we want to immunize ourselves from the diabolical machinations of the erstwhile colonial master now turned neo-colonizer, we have to move here as one Africa with the United States of Africa, with one army, with one currency, with one central bank, and with one nation. But they listen to him not. They had started getting used to the trappings of power. So what they came out with on that day in the month of May 1963 was a weak organization of African unity, the OAU, which many commentators were quick to describe in many ways and many times as the toothless bulldog. It was never a dog. It did not have teeth, but the effect of it is that he did not do very much. Some say it was a talking shop. Mzewa Ryoba, who was then uh, active in political life and in other sectors, will attest to that. Yet later, we were to create another body, the African Union, and we'll have something to say about that. So we come out of Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, in 1963, clear as to what we want to do. The African politician begins to emerge. We have them in different parts, but they begin to show characters that are to totally inimical to our expectations. You of the Swahili say, Maskini akipata matako huliambwata. Maskini walipata matako zililia mbwata. They started getting used to the trappings of power. And we started having countries which we thought would liberate us. And I'm talking about the hygiene of the politics. It started disappearing. Many of these individuals now thought that they were demigods. Suffering from what I call the Messiah complex thinking that they had been brought to Africa to liberate her and that they suffered from two major diseases. One of them is the martyr syndrome and the other one is the Messiah complex. They think that they, their countries owed them. Africa started producing leaders that one cannot recognize. How many of you will forget Jean Bedel Bokassa of Central African Republic? That man who murdered little children in the streets because
because they did not buy uniform from his wife, that job battle Bokas. How many of you will, will forget Mobutu Sese Seku Kukumbendu Wanzambanga? Who changed his country's name and presided over a kleptocratic regime. The Democratic Republic of Congo is the richest resource country on earth. Conservatively they said that under her belly she has minerals which is equivalent to 34.1 trillion United States dollars. And yet today, it is one of the poorest nations on earth. It is the only nation on earth which on the day of the election has its president saying, we know we ought to have elections, but we have no money to hold elections. When you see a country which has as its official name the Democratic Republic of Congo know that there is no democracy. In fact, I dare say that any country, two countries that I know insisting on having as a part of the official name the Democratic Republic of something are never democratic. The other one is Korea, the People's Democratic Republic of Korea. It's as if when you can't graduate to be a doctor, you go to the church and you ask to be baptized as Dr. Mwadime. But that is not the point. The point is that who can forget Mobutu Sese Seko? Who can forget Idi Amin of Uganda? Who can forget Mengistu Hail Mariam of Ethiopia? And one can go on and on because hygiene had started disappearing from African politics. Our agriculture was beginning to suffer. European musicians who had a little sense of guilt came to perform in Africa, Bob Geldof, to free the Ethiopians out of hunger. There was no hygiene in our politics. We could not run our education systems. Our young men and women were going to India because the budgets meant for education were consumed by individuals whom we had entrusted with the task of presiding over it. Our health sectors were beginning to collapse. And as I've said before, the political leadership did not have any faith in those institutions. Typically, the typical African politician, perhaps not in Tanzania today, if they were sick, they had a cold, they would not go to Muhimbili, they would go to London. If they were Kenyan, they would not go to Kenyatta Hospital, they would run to the United Kingdom. Tragedy, no hygiene in our politics because Africans had started engaging in theft. In fact, I used to say that African politicians were thieves. Then I went to Uganda and I was told that they are not thieves, they are looters. And when I went to Liberia last week, they were, I was told they are not looters. I was told they are looters on an industrial scale. That is the logical metamorphosis of the African politician whose appetite for public wealth is completely insatiable. Hygiene was disappearing from African politics. And we could see the effect of the disappearance of hygiene in African politics. But there was always the erstwhile colonial master to assist. Coup d'etat started visiting Africa. Modibo Keita in Mali was consumed. Namdi Azikiwe in Nigeria was consumed. The Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma was consumed. Apollo Milton Obote was consumed. Amilka Cabral in Guinea Bissau was consumed. Patrice Emery Lumumba was consumed. Coups were so frequent in Africa that Afro-pessimists were now hard to say that coups were as frequent as breakfast.
But even breakfast was not frequent on African tables. We could not feed ourselves because there was no hygiene in African politics. Your typical African politicians took the view that they had a divine mission to preside over their countries. They arrogated to themselves the monopoly of wisdom. If you listen to some of them, and I listen to the radio announcements announcing the activities of one leader of an African country, Habia Rimana Juvenal. It would take three minutes to say the things that he had done. He was the leading farmer. He was the leading singer. He was the leading intellectual. He was the leading husband. And he was the leading everything. We had monsterized our leaders and they became immune from any kind of advice. Meanwhile, the African was suffering. The African woman who thought that upon attainment of political independence, she would now deliver in a decent hostel was still the victim of a village midwife. The African woman was suffering. The African woman who thought that they would now get water in a tap in their homes was still running five kilometers away to get water. Meanwhile, our monster leaders were laundering their clothes in, in France and in Paris. The African woman who thought that they would go to Kariako market here in Dar es Salaam or Owino market in Kampala, Uganda and get all the goodies, could not get them. Because meanwhile, the Minister for Agriculture had agreed that bad seed be supplied. And meanwhile, we were getting mangoes from Europe. The African woman who thought that they could have food on the table could not have food on the table. We had killed all our sugar industries that we may have sugar from Brazil and Mexico. And the African youth was no different. The African youth who thought that upon realization of independence, there would be occasion for them to get employment was now being humiliated at the embassies of the United States of America as he struggled to get the almighty green card. The young African who thought that liberation would bring something new was now struggling at the United Kingdom Embassy, filling a document that is 50 pages long, being asked who their great-great-grandfathers were and what enterprise they were engaged in. And they could not stop there. They went to the Australian Embassy and to the French Embassy, and the treatment was the same. The African youth was being treated like a leper, like a pariah, like a subhuman being. And they were asking, for what purpose did we gain this thing called independence? And those who are not humiliated in Gambia, in Nigeria, in Niger, were crossing the Red Sea, swimming across the Mediterranean to go to Italy so that they may be enslaved anew. Meanwhile, the African leader was busy looting from their countries and buying mansions in Paris and in London and in Florida and driving private jets and helicopters and being addressed as their excellencies and honorables instead of being addressed properly as horribles. Hygiene had disappeared in African politics. And what had started happening is that a new generation of African leaders who were dissatisfied started emerging. And one need only look at Africa in the 1980s when we begin to see the emergence of a new crop of leaders who are saying, this is not what we fought for. And I can remember so very vividly Ethiopia's Meles Zenawi in 1984 abandoning his medical studies 
and pursuing the dark regime of Mengist to Hail Mariam. And he removed Hail Mariam. And there is a sense in which some hygiene has been reintroduced in Ethiopia. And I can remember here, God works in strange ways. Idi Amin made the mortal mistake of assuming that Tanzania and Mwalimu Julius Nyerere could be poked without consequence. He tried and he died regretting it. And this became, indeed, many of you will remember that this University of Dar es Salaam became the finishing school of latter-day revolutionaries. John Garang de Mabior was here. Yoweri Kaguta Museveni was here. If they were not students, they passed through here because this was the mecca of political revolutionaries. Eduardo Mondlane was here. Samora Marshall passed through here, if only for a few hours. Nelson Holisa Samandela passed through here. Sam Nuyoma came through here. This was the baptism ground. And the high priest was Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere. It was he who, in a manner of speaking, said, With this water I thee baptize, that you may go out there and change your country. And Yoweri Kaguta Museveni went out into Uganda, and there is a sense, whether you like it or not, in which some hygiene was introduced in that country. There is a sense in which when Samora Moises Mashal left this ground, he went to Mozambique, and there was a sense in which some hygiene was introduced in that country. There is a sense in which John Garang de Mabior left here, and some hygiene was beginning to be introduced in South Sudan. Right now, the story is a little different, but one can see that there was this new crop of leaders who recognized that indeed we had to do something about it. But ladies and gentlemen, what had happened over the years? Let us ask ourselves the fate of Africa when I say that there is a need for political hygiene Africa today has 54 odd countries and allow me to take you through a tour of Africa if the moderator will be gracious enough to give me latitude when you start from the Cape in South Africa there is a great country which has given birth to great men. 1912, the first political party to be founded in Africa, the African National Congress of Sir Albert Lutuli. That party has given birth to the Mandelas, to the governing Beckys, to the Reginald Oliver Tambo. There was great pain during the apartheid regime, but wisdom prevailed upon President de Klerk. And in 1994, we created what was called a rainbow niche. Mandela had his honeymoon. Then came Governor Mbeki, Otabo Mbeki, the son of Governor Mbeki. Then came Jacob Zuma. I do not know where Jacob is taking South Africa. But from where I am, there is need for hygiene in South Africa. Because that is a great country. And that is the anchor of Southern Africa. Nelson Mandela left a country that was called the Rainbow Nation. Today I'm beginning to hear them talk about the Zulu and the Kosa and the Pedi. It is your own Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere who says... Katika karni ya ishirini na moja mnasema tupande basi la makabila. Hiyo ni uchinga na upumbafu. Then there is another country because there is need for hygiene in African politics. And when one talks about hygiene, one wants to see improved agriculture. 
One wants to see improved infrastructure. One wants to see improved education. One wants to see that the quality of the life of our women and children is improved. And you go to Namibia, there is a sense in which there is some hygiene there. If only, if only the land question could be solved. That would be a country that is worthy, is moving in the right direction. One can begin to see that. Then you move to Angola, that unfortunate land of Agostino, Nato, and you will remember Holden Roberto and Jonas Malheiro Savimbi. There is a sense in which that country was traumatized. I'm happy to note that President Dos Santos now says he is going to retire in 2018. My only concern is that he is sick now and he is seeking treatment in Madrid, Spain. Why don't they have a good hostel in Luanda, Angola? After you've been a president for 20 years, you are going to another civilization to treat you? There is a sense in which there was lack of hygiene. Then you go to Botswana, that great country, 1966, Botswana was a backwater country with nothing but courtesy of an individual who knew that hygiene depended and required that you improve the quality of people's lives. Sir, Kama. And you know when you have hygiene, even the politics becomes hygienic. And you realize that politics is not a life and death issue. That politics is a question of the competition of ideas. I've just read a Tanzanian newspaper here which I thought was very insightful. Siasa ni kupambanisha hoja siyo vioja. And there is beauty in that. And Nyerere put it even better in much more eloquent Kiswahili than I can master. He said, Kwanza, tutambue ya kwamba, ikulu ni mahali patakatifu. But I'm still talking about Botswana, Saserese, Kama, Ketumile, Masire, Festus Mohai and Ian Kama. They now know that politics is not life and death. That is a country where there is hygiene. For those who are Afro-pessimists who think that nothing is happening in Africa, something is happening. They are monsters, but they are also angels. But did they not exist like that even in the heavens? Lucifer alongside Michael and Gabriel? It would appear that as it is in heaven, so it is on earth. And if you go to Mozambique, you can also begin to see that there is a problem there. But there is an attempt at hygiene. You go to Zambia, that is another country, Kenneth David Kaunda. On the day that he left office, Kenneth David Kaunda had only $8,000 in his account. If you ask your typical African-Tanzanian counselor today, before Magufuli came in, that was pocket change. After 24 years in power, $8,000 only. Those are people who love their country and sacrifice. There is a need for hygiene in Zambia. It is the only country in the world that I know where when an opposition leader blocks a motorcade, it does not become the offense of obstruction. It becomes the offense of treason. Unprecedented in the world. Hygiene is necessary in that country. And I look forward to hygiene being introduced. Then one comes to Tanzania. You know, Tanzania, when one talks about hygiene, one must start in the 1960s. One must remember the Arusha Declaration and the nobility of the intentions of Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere. And that is why many of you may not know, but at one time it was suggested that he be made a saint of the Catholic Church. And the reason was very simple. This was a man who had ideas. This was a man who had clarity of thought. 
This was a man who could see the future almost with the exactitude of a Jewish prophet. This was a man who had the humility almost like the humility of the carpenter of Nazareth. This was a man who loved his country. He made mistakes and when he made them, he realized and corrected them. That is his greatness. Is it not Saint Just who said that nobody can rule guiltlessly? This is a man who found 120 plus ethnic groups and welded them into one niche. So that Tanzanians speak with one voice. You know, if you look at Tanzania and you ask your typical Tanzanian, what was the ethnic extraction of President Kambarage Nyerere? They do not know and they do not care. If you ask Tanzanians what was the ethnic extraction of the second president of Tanzania, Mze Ali Hassan Mwinyi, the Tanzanians do not know and they do not care because it does not matter. If you ask them, what was the ethnic extraction of the third president of Tanzania, Benjamin William Mkapa? They do not know, and it does not matter, and they do not care. And if you ask Tanzania, what was the ethnic extraction of your fourth president, Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete? They do not know, and they do not care. And if you ask them, what is the extraction of your fifth president, John Pombe Magufuli, they do not know and they do not care. They only know that he's a bulldozer. <laughs> but you go to my country, Kenya, God save my country. God save my country. When you meet your typical Kenyan and you introduce yourself as John, they'll ask for the second name, not that may, they may know your full names, but that they may identify you with your ethnicity and pigeonhole you accordingly. When you go into that country, which is a great country in prospect, but which is being destroyed, by negative ethnicity, you ask them who the first president of Kenya was, they'll tell you it was Jomo Kenyatta and he was Kikuyu and we care, we want our Kikuyu president. And if you ask them who was the second president, they'll tell you it was Daniel Arab Moy of the Kalenjin extraction and we cared because it was our turn to eat. And if you ask them who was the third president, they'll tell you it is Uhuru Mwigai Kenyatta and he is a Kikuyu and we want him to continue because we Kikuyus and we Kalenjin only feel safe when one of our own is in state house. And if you ask the opposition and you ask the leaders, you ask the leaders from my own ethnic group, the Luo of Kenya, the law will tell you we have been marginalized for too long. The time has come that God must smile upon us and our son must be the president. And if you ask the Luhias, they'll say the same thing. That is the tragedy of gigantic proportions. I'm submitting to us that the country called Kenya needs political hygiene. I'm submitting to us that the country called Kenya needs to come to Tanzania here on a benchmarking tour and that the president of the Republic of Kenya and all our parliamentarians should sit at the state house and be lectured by John Pompe Magufuli on the finer points of governance. Of course, Mze Warioba will be there and other stalwarts will be there. Salim Ahmed Salim will be there. Great Tanzanians will be there. And Nyerere will remind us. Katika karne. Ya ishirini na moja. Tupande. Basi. Ya makabila. Ujinga na upumbafu. Because it can destroy a nation. 
there is need for political hygiene in Kenya. Right now in Nigeria, the Igbos want to secede and they are being warned by the Yorubas and the Northerners. There is need for political hygiene. But let me also say one of the things that relates to hygiene. Aside from negative ethnicity, there is another thing that has killed Africa and taken away political hygiene, corruption. You know, it would appear that we of the Negroid blood relate very poorly with this thing called money. Money is a useful facility that enables you to do things with ease. But if you allow money to control you and you begin to adore money and you acquire appetite for money, then you are in trouble. And I want to submit to us that Africa is the only continent in the world where upon appointment into political office, or upon ascending to the political office, it's as if you have won a lottery ticket to sudden wealth. In Africa, when you are appointed a minister, even the newspapers will say if you are appointed to the Ministry of Finance, he has been appointed to the lucrative Ministry of Finance. If you are appointed to the Ministry of Agriculture or Mining, they say you've been appointed to the lucrative ministry of mining. But when you are appointed the minister of culture, they say you've been appointed to the lean ministry of culture. In other words, there is a sense in which institutions in Africa appear to believe that he who gets into public office has a license to be a thief. And if you look at many African countries, many African leaders, cannot account for, for their wealth. They have stripped their countries naked. You know, when I look at some of the great leaders of Africa, some who will not be remembered so very fondly by history, I regret. Robert Gabriel Mugabe of Zimbabwe. Nyinyi wa Swahili mnasema wali wa kushiba uonekana kwenye sinia. In 1980s when Mugabe took power, it was said of him that he had the largest number of degrees of any leader in the world and he had degrees. It was said that he was a passionate revolutionary and he was a passionate revolutionary. It was said that he had liberated Rhodesia, renamed Zimbabwe into a great country. And for the first 10 years, he did a good job. Then, something happened. Different commentators have different ways of saying. Some of them say that Sally died and he married Grace. And it has never been the same again. I do not know. Some of them said that he became a prisoner of some of his comrades. I do not know. But the only thing that I know is that all the historical dividends he had accumulated have now been squandered. Why? They have been squandered because Robert Gabriel Mugabe now presides over a country where there is 90% unemployment. Robert Gabriel Mugabe now presides over a country which does not have a currency but has a central bank. This is unprecedented in the history of modern civilization. I'm submitting to us that corruption has been at the very heart of the destruction of Africa. That is why we do not have roads. That is why we do not have good hostels. That is why we cannot feed ourselves in Kenya today. We and Ethiopia, we are importing maize from Mexico. In Liberia, they're importing chicken from Brazil. And in many countries, we cannot even feed ourselves. We do not make our own medicine. Medicine is made as generics in India. We do not even produce our own seeds to plant our fields. They are being made by Syngenta and Monsanto. We do not produce anything because of corruption. 
but there is a sense in which one can begin to see some hygiene there is a sense when I arrived here in Dar es Salaam and I look at the newspapers and I see a white gentleman having flown into Tanzania in a private jet from the company called Acacia goes into State House in Dar es Salaam and literally almost saying Mia Kalpa, Mia Kalpa Mia Maxima Kalp. Nimekosa sana, nimekosa sana, nimekosa sana. And President John Pombe Magufuli, as if he was a Catholic father, saying, Nimekuskia Mwanang. Nimekuskia Mwanang. Tutakurumia, lakini kwa mashar. Na mashart ni ya kwamba lazima ulipe ulizo zipora. I felt told that there is an African leader who can stand up to international pirates who for 20 years have deprived Tanzania of taxes that would have gone to schools. Taxes that would have gone to the health sector. Taxes that would have gone to infrastructure. Taxes that would have gone into agriculture. John Pombe Magufuli is a breath of fresh air. I know that there are some Tanzanians who may think that he's disrupting their agenda. John Pombe Magufuli disrupt their agenda. For if you come into a country and you find a country, a patient suffering from cancer, you've got to subject them to chemotherapy. And when you administer chemotherapy, the hair will fall out a little. There will be some pain. That pain is necessary because there is no gain without pain. I'm not a Jewish prophet nor related to one. I'm not a member of CCM. But if John Pombe Magufuli continues on this trajectory and has a second term, in the next 10 years, Tanzania will be one of the largest economies in this country. God save John Pombe Magufuli. You know, I was reading a tweet and some American is saying, bring us John Pombe Magufuli. And I was in Kenya and I said at one time that we need to magulify Kenya. <laughs> in other words, there is a sense in which a new English word can be found, the magufulification of Africa. <laughs> in fact, I dare say that even my own paper, instead of calling it a call for hygiene in African politics, I would say the magufulification of Africa, and I would still be right. But the whites say that one swallow does not make a summer. There are other good examples in Africa of the beginning of the introduction of political hygiene. Ian Kama in Botswana. Ian Kama in Botswana, it is said that a minister in his government went to him and said, I've been named in a scandal. Your Excellency, help me. He told him there is nothing that I can do. The individual went to his rural home. The following day, it is reported that he had committed suicide. I'm not a sadist, nor do I intend to be one. But if there are such individuals, I want more suicides. <laughs> Ian Kama is yet another breath of fresh air. Paul Kagame of Rwanda. 1994, the United Nations turned away. The Rwandese, within 100 days, anything between 800,000 and 1 million Tutsis and moderate Hutus were killed even in churches. Then there came a tall, lanky man, Paul Kagame, and his comrades in arms. I was there two days ago, and one of the best drives out of any airport in the world 
is to be found in Kigali in Rwanda. And you can see so that those who thought that Africans cannot do it, our color is innocent. The Negroid, the dark color is innocent. It is not in our DNA. No. What happens is that there are some within our ranks who are errant, who must be punished. One can go on and on, but even my own good friend, Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, found a dilapidated Uganda. And even if you say that Yoweri has now stayed a little longer, there is a sense in which history will remember him fondly. One can go on and on, but one must also remember that lunch must be served. And if one remembers that lunch must be served, one must also remember that there is the law of diminishing returns. And one must also remember that one must now grow to their conclusion, even as they are talking about a call for political hygiene. So I'm submitting to us this morning that Africa can be great and Africa must be great. But Africa will only be great if we Africans do that which is good and right. The great Indian nationalist Chakravati Raja Gopalachari said that when politics stumbles, the country pays. So the first thing that we must do is to introduce hygiene in our politics. And now that I'm in Tanzania, the first thing that we must do is to magulify our politics. I know that there is a Kiswahili saying, Mgema Kisifi wa Tembo Litiamaji, and I'm conscious that one of the names of President Magufuli is Pombe. But I have no doubt that President Magufuli will remain on the right course. As you say here in Tanzania, Atabaki kwenye njiaku hata chepua. I'm suggesting to us that we introduce hygiene in our politics. Which means, and Mzee Warieba will remember when we were talking about the constitution, Africans must begin looking at their constitution and they must be constitutions which are address the African environment. You know, there was a time after the fall of the Berlin Wall when European powers from London Paris, Madrid, and Washington told us that democracy is equals to multi-party politics. Democracy equals to this. I now hold the view that while plurality is a good thing, a constitutional review gives us an opportunity to come up with homegrown solutions. Mzewa Ryoba, I'm happy that we did not have the constitution when we thought we would have it. You now have had the advantage of seeing our Kenyan constitution, which I think now has created an environment that makes governance very difficult. You, when you make a constitution, make a better constitution than we did. I'm submitting to us that we must now look at our constitution as the primary governance document in order to ensure that we create hygiene in our politics. First of all, there is a sense in which the electorate must also be educated. Democracy presupposes that the electorate is mature and the electorate knows what it wants. You know, three days ago, an individual from my ethnic group called me and he told me this. This time round, we are taking it. And I said, who are we? And he told me, don't you know? I knew what he was saying, of course. And immediately I told him, never, ever appeal to my ethnic sensibilities. I did not go to school that I vote individuals because they come from my ethnic group. Tell me their agenda on health, their agenda on agriculture, so that if I vote for them, it should just be coincidental that we come from the same ethnic extraction. I'm submitting to us that even you, the electorate, when you are called upon to vote, vote right. 
I remember in 2007 when I attempted to seek a parliamentary seat and I had a 10 point agenda with Sarah Zangu. The people said, Sisi atutaki Sarah tunataka Karo. Then I told them subsequently that how is it, and I repeat it again here, you have been given an opportunity to elect. You elect a hyena to take care of goats, and then when the goats have been eaten, you wonder why. I'm submitting to us that one of the ways is having a new constitutional dispensation. The other thing that we must do beyond the institution, beyond the constitution, is to have institutions. You know, Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere, whom you now rightly refer to as Baba Wataifa said, you are not successful until your successor succeeds. Today, Mwalimu Kambarage Nyerere is successful because his successors have succeeded. Did you not have Mze Mwinyi? Did you not have Benjamin William Kappa? Did you not have Jakaya Mrisho Kikwete? Did you not have John Pombe Magufuli who have seen us said we must protect the sitting presidents in order to preserve the nation sometimes memories must be selective. I remember after the civil war in Nigeria the young Yakubu Gowon receiving the Biafrans who had surrendered said brothers I'm happy to see you. And the commentator says at a critical point in Nigerian history, the victor did not gloat and the vanquished were not humiliated. What Pombe Magufuli is doing is right. There is no future without forgiveness. There is no future without selective memories, but we must never forget. I'm submitting to us that the only thing that survives and will introduce hygiene in African politics is institutions. Because institutions will exist beyond us. And I'm happy to say that in Tanzania, one begins to see institutions. One begins to see individuals who are smaller than institutions. Because if you are larger than institution, then you consume institution. And Mobutu Sese Seko reminded us that when he changed his name from Joseph Desire Mobutu to Mobutu Sese Seko Kukumbendu Wanzambanga. And when he died, until today, the Democratic Republic of Congo is not at ease. Beyond the institution, the other thing that we must do is that we must have men and women of integrity. These men and women of integrity are not angels. They will have made mistakes, but they will have learned from those mistakes. These men and women should be subjected to certain ideals. That is why Mwalimu Nyerere once again said, Lazima tuwe na siyasa ya maadili na miko. There must be taboos in politics, the do's and the don'ts. Pukiwa na sera huria, basi ni uhuni utatamalaki. I'm submitting to us that we must have integrity in order to inject hygiene in Kenya, in, 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 in African politics. I'm submitting to us the fourth thing that the other thing that we must do is that we must de-ethnicize our politics. And I'm saying it doesn't mean that you reject your being a Sukuma or a Mahaya or a Luo or a Kamba. Celebrate all those. But remember that in order to produce melodious music, you play the white of the piano and the black of the piano, and lo and behold, there is symphony and there is harmony and there is joy. I'm submitting to us that in order to introduce hygiene in our politics, the quality of the lives of the people must be improved. The gross national happiness index must improve, not the gross domestic product. I'm submitting to us that the misery index must go down. 
In other words, young Tanzanians and young Africans must have the opportunity to realize their potential. They must not go out to be humiliated. You know, today, and if there is any Chinese in the assembly, forgive me because the Chinese are an amazing people. 30 years ago, China was a third world country. Then they made a decision and China will never be the same again. I want to submit to you, all of you who are in this assembly, 99% of the things that you have are from China. If it is your phone, even if it is iPhone, it is assembled in China. Everything we have is from China. China has become the factory of the world. They know what they want and they are going for it. I'm submitting to us that if we are to produce hygiene in African politics, we must know what we want. Nyerere used to say, wakati mwingine wa Afrika tunabaki tunashangaa na kuduat. Eh, wa China hawa. I'm submitting to us that China knows what is wants and Africa must now ask herself, what does she want for her women? What does she want for her young men and women? And I have no doubt that we have the wherewithal to find out what we want. I'm submitting to us that we must also introduce equality and inclusivity. Our women must be given their pride of place. And I must say, you know, somebody said something with which I agreed terribly two days ago. Why must it be that when we are dealing with our women and our youth, we must create for them a microfinance? A mi Why? For how long will our women will be in micro enterprises? Why can't our women be involved in mega enterprises? I'm submitting to us that we must mainstream our women because 52% of the population cannot be left in the periphery. And I'm saying that when you include everybody, when everybody is at the dinner table, then everybody will be happy because the last time I checked, I used to think that there were two ways of being at the dinner table of civilization. And I used to say that at the dinner table of civilization, you can be present as a waiter or a diner. But two days ago, somebody told me, no, that you can also be the food to be eaten. So Africans choose you now. What role you want to play at the dinner table? Do you want to be the food to be eaten? Do you want to be the waiter to be waiting upon the diner? Or you want to be the diner? Africans have been food for too long. Africans have been waiters for too long. This is the time to be diners at the dinner table of democracy. I'm submitting to us that we are not children of a lesser God. I'm saying that there is a tide in the affairs of man which taken on a crest leads to great fortunes. But if you miss them, it leads to great miseries. Shakespeare was right. Chinua Achebe was right. If you want and you seek, you will never fail to find. Difficulties may and indeed will exist, but it's through overcoming them that we grow stronger. And I'm submitting to us that we have the ability to do that. And to the young Africans, Chinua Achebe posed the question, where are the young suckers that will grow when the old banana dies? Are you those young suckers that will grow when the old bananas who are seated here die? Because the future of Africa is in your hands. Young Chinese are coming here teaching us how to read Mandarin. Are we teaching them Kiswahili? Young Chinese are coming here working seven days a week. Are you working seven days a week? You artists, Kuku can var Raizoni, but beyond varing Raizoni, the cuckoo must learn and liberate Africa. You young Africans, why are you going to Europe and America? You young Africans, why are you celebrating Manchester United, not younger? You young Africans, why don't you have Sande Manara and Gibson Sembuli recreated 
rather than Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi. You young Africans, why are you celebrating Julio Iglesias? Why are you not celebrating Farida Karoli? Why are you not remembering Baraka Munshehe Maruka solo in his national? I'm submitting to us that in order to have political hygiene, we must also have self-esteem. Kwa Kiswahili lazima tujiamini sisi. Self-esteem. Once we have self-esteem that we know that we are equal and that God in his divine wisdom decided the God that I worship is a God of diversity. He looks at a white man and a white woman and he says behold the great creation. And he turns to the Arab, the brown Arab and says oh what a good brown creation. And he turns to the slitty eyed Chinese and the Japanese and he says behold what a great creation. And he turns to the Negroid and says I perfected it here. What a perfect turn. So that when we sit at the dinner table of civilization, it is the diversity that we should look forward to. And I'm submitting to us that once we've done all that, then Africa will be great. Once we have done all that, Africa will be great and Africa can be great. But Africa will not be great on the basis of pronouncements. I know that the Africans sat in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia and came uh, with Africa Agenda 2063. But Africa will not realize Agenda 2063 when 90% of African Union budget is externally financed. He who calls the piper calls the tune that old English saying is still true. Because as they say in French, in French plus sa chance plus la même chose the more things change the more they remain the same in africa but i'm submitting to us that this time round it they must not remain the same so fellow africans and individuals who may not be africans but are from other civilization and our sisters and brothers make africa great this continent can be great Make Africa's education great. Let Dar es Salaam University be great. Let Nairobi be great. Let Fura Bay in Sierra Leone be great. Let our education be great and we will make it great. Let African agriculture be great. Let us feed ourselves. Let us have food and beef and chicken and grains made in Africa. Let African agriculture be great. Let African infrastructure be great. Let us have the new train moving from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia to Dhaka in Senegal and from Cape Town to Cairo. Let there be great infrastructure. Let us have one passport so that when I arrive at Dar es Salaam, I'm not asked for my passport. Please let us have one. Let us have one currency so that I don't have to fly for one hour and I confront Tanzanian shilling. I fly for 55 minutes, I confront the Rwandese franc. I confront the Angolan Kwanza. Let us have a unit of currency which is uniform. You can call it the Afro, whichever name you prefer, but let us have one currency. I'm submitting to us that we can be great Let us have our women have occupied their pride of place. Let us make the Congo, the Silicon Valley of Africa. Let us make Niger or Burkina Faso the head of nuclear power. Let us make Congo and the Kariba the production headquarters of electricity. Let there be light in Africa. Let there be light in Africa. And I'm submitting to us that that can be achieved. if we introduce hygiene in african politics and african affairs let us have africa magulified god bless you i'm dr wale okedino a former mem member of the parliament from nigeria and um, i have two questions for you um, when you are making your 
beautiful uh, presentation. You condemned uh, uh, President Mugabe for staying too long. But you are partial to uh, Museveni and uh, Paul uh, Kagani. Uh, are you trying to tell us that uh, we can allow a little extension of office for our leaders? Or how do we do this? Thank you. Thank you. I am uh, Dr. Camillus Kasala of the Eastern Africa Statistical Training Center. I have followed Professor Lumumba's presentation. I would like to submit to us that this, what I'm going to say, will be the summary of his presentation, very short. There is no hygiene in African politics because of what I call the not always vicious circle. This circle begins with what is logical in African politics is not always practical. What is practical is not always right. What is right is not always ethical. What is ethical is not always desired. And what is desired takes us back to what is not always logical. Now, what is the hygiene? Mwalim Nyerere avoided what I call temptations of five Ps. And I would like the young people here to listen very, very carefully. Because the world today is everywhere broadcasting these five P temptations. Please, future African leaders, the young people, avoid the first P. Avoid being the victim of the first P. The first P is power. Avoid being the victim of the second P, property. Avoid being the victim of the third P, prestige. Avoid being the victim of the fourth P, popularity. And avoid being the victim of the last P, pomposity. Waswaili wanaitwa wanaita mbwe mbwe. Mziepuke hizo zote. Asante sana. Thank you very much. I believe I can answer from here. Let me start with... Uh the last question that you posed. And as I grow older, I hold the view that my answers do not necessarily represent the truth. This is my view of the issues. Opposition in modern day Africa is very reasoned. If you look at the first leaders, the whole idea of building the nation they thought could best be articulated by having one party state. They said, we are so fragile, we are so diverse, that we must have one political party. And there is a sense in which they were right. If you look at your typical European nation, and I want you to look at Europe from Sweden, there will invariably be nation states. If you go to Sweden, they are the Swedes with a small Lap or Sami population. And you'll find they have a small parliament for them. If you go to Norway, you'll discover they are Norwegians, almost 99%. If you go to Finland, is the bulk of them are the Finns with a small Swedish population. If you go to Denmark, they are the Danes. If you go to the Netherlands, they are the Dutch. If you go to Spain, where there are a multiplicity of ethnicities, then there are problems. You have a problem, you remember, during the reign of General Franco, of the Basque country, even up till now, the Catalans, the Galicians. So there is a sense in which Europe, in fact, I dare say, Africa handles diversity better than Europe does. 
If you go to the Baltics, you find the former Yugoslavia, which has produced several countries from Yugoslavia. You have the Slovenes, the Bosnians, the Herzegovina. There is a sense the Soviet Union collapsed before our very eyes. But Africa somehow, and this was once again, many of you will remember in 1963, uh, the Addis Ababa Conference and 1964, the Cairo Conference, what is normally referred to as the Nasserite Nyerere's Nukrumaist approach, that we should not redraw African boundaries because it would create conflict. And there was a sense, therefore, that if you came to many African countries, they say, let us have one party states. And many of the party states, the states or the, the, uh, the parties that took over power were revolutionary parties. They were freedom fighting party parties. If you came to Kenya, Kenya African National, Kenya African National Union in Tanzania, Tanu and Afro Shirazi in South Africa, African National Congress, MPLF, Relimo, ZANU PF, and all these parties, and they took the view: let us have one party, so that everybody is under the umbrella of that party to avoid ethnic division. And one may quarrel about that particular approach, but if you look at it there was merit in it. Then, of course, Europe persuaded us. Europe is always in the business of persuading us. That you cannot have democracy when there is only one party. And that, therefore, we have multi-party politics. And many African countries were dragged, wailing and kicking to this dinner table of multi-partism. Nyerere was one of the clever ones he did it before everybody did it and said, let us admit it. And you had NCCR, Magehuzi, Chadema, and all those parties. But the net effect is that the African politician is a very conflicted individual. Because on the one hand, he has a culture and tradition defining how he behaves. But on the one hand, he also wants to behave as if he is a typical British or Dutch politician. So I, I say sometimes that when you looked at an African politician, he suffers from split personality. And I say this in all seriousness. What the African politicians in many countries say on the platform is not what they believe in. And our own president, former president Daniel Moy used to say it very well. After he had read the English speech, he would say, Ni mesema hayo ni mesema, sasa wacha ni seme. In other words, there are things that you say for the comfort and benefit of the so-called modern and modern society and for Europe and America and Washington to hear, but there are things that you now say to Wazawa. And those things are different. So multi-party politics, because when you introduce multi-party politics, the assumption is that there are clear ideological differences. If you go to Europe and America and you talk about the Tories, there are ways in which they believe that government must be run in this way. You go to the United States of America, there are sense in which the Republicans have a way in which they think government should be run. If you go to different countries, but if you come to Tanzania, what is it that Chadema wants to do that is different from CCM? What is it that NCCR Mageuzi wants to do that is different from CCM? If you look at them, the difference is possibly 1%. If you come go to Kenya, where we have 63 political parties, if you ask these individuals, what do you want to do? They'll tell you we hold the view They'll not tell you in so many words. I'm the one who normally says it on national television. They hold the view that because the present administration is an administration that has brought together the Kikuyus and the Kalinjins, the next combination should now have the Luos and the Luhias and the Kambas and a little Maasai so that essentially the election will have in the month of August on the 8th as I've said rather harshly and bluntly, is not an election on issues. It is an ethnic census to determine whether a combination of Kikuyus and Kalinjins 
is larger than that of Luos, Luhias, and Cambas, or vice versa. And if you look at how they have divided it, they have actually said it. If you look at the, our typical Kenyan politician, he says, we the Luos, it is our turn now. We the Luhias, it is our turn now. So that when we talk about opposition, Running an African country is not very easy. If you go to Angola, it is the Ovambo and the Ovimundu. If you go to South Africa, it's the same thing. You've got to make, ensure that Zuma is the president because you've got to settle the spirits of the Zulu. If you go to Nigeria, right now the Igbo think they're excluded. And if you want, if General Buhari is unwell, the talk is already there. Will Osinbajo take over or will it be a northerner? Rather premature if you ask me. So what is opposition? If I was a president of a country, this is what I would do. Recognizing that African countries are fragile, I would have monthly meetings with all opposition leaders. Monthly. Because some of these opposition leaders, the truth be told, what they want is to be heard. They want to have an opportunity to contribute to the entire, to the entire national enterprise. And they have good ideas, some of them. But in, in many ways, they have good ideas. And I think that there is a sense, if you look at an article that has been written by Mwalimu Nyerere a while ago, he says, if you read more, you become more enlightened. There is a sense in which that is what African leaders forget to do. Mandela tried to do it when he was the president. One day, when he went out, he appointed Gacha Butelezi to be the president. And Gacha, I think, was very satisfied during those few days. So one of the things that we must realize, opposition and government, is that we are working and moving in the same direction. So my prescription, whether it's taken or not, is another debate. Ensure that these individuals are involved. Have quarterly meetings with all of them. Tell them, this is how you tell us how to run government. In fact, in many African countries, what I would do is to ask the opposition leader, I'm putting together my government. Do you have any problem with being appointed into my cabinet to serve so that these beautiful ideas, we mix mine with yours and we govern Tanzania? That would be my approach. And I think in that way, the opposition then becomes responsible. It becomes the loyal, responsible opposition. Otherwise, the opposition then exists to oppose everything and to propose nothing. And you can kill that by involvement. So that is my answer to that question. The second question is about uh, foundation. Let me give an example. I was listening to a debate by the former head of UNIDO, who is a Sierra Leonean and is contesting to the president. And I said to a friend of mine, if this man has these ideas and I was Sierra Leone, I would vote him. He said, Africa can realize our potential. And this idea that Africa has had conflict is misguided. And he gave examples. Vietnam was at war. Cambodia was at war. Laos was at war. The two Koreas were at war in 1953. Japan was bombed to the ground in 1945. Yet, they have revived. They went back to the foundation that you talked about. In other words, to we know the true north to Nadira. And Mwalimu used to say in Kiswahili, Siri ya maendeleo ni watu ardhi na siasa safi. And siasa safi means that you have the maadili mzee has already, in fact mzee the next time I'm called, I'm going to Uganda and I'm going to use the five Ps and I'll say I heard them from you. Because in truth, if you look at those five Ps, that is the problem. Umejua ukizungumzia hili swala la mamlaka, Mwafrika, kiongozi Mwafrika kwanza katika hafla kama hii, kiongozi asili wa Kiafrika ukimwalika saa 4 anakuja saa 5. Na yuko tu katika mkahawa anapiga simu, je, wametulia hapo? Wametulia kabisa. Bas wakisha tulia anaambiwa wametulia, sasa anakuja na mbwembwe na vingora. Na mikia wanyama pia wanatingisha hivi. They think that that is what will make them important. That is power ambayo unaizungumzia. 
na swala hili la kuhodhi na kumiliki mali unapata mtu ana vyumba vingi tu na umejua kilichoko katika kuhodhi mali huku ni kama kunywa maji ya, ya, ya chumvi kadri unavyokunywa ndivyo unavyotaka zaidi haisitiri kadri mtu ana nyumba nyingi tu arobaini katika Dar es Salaam alisoma hivi karibuni mmoja wa takukuru alipatikana na nyumba nyingi tu mtu kama huyo ni kitu kipi anakitaka huyo mtu ana magari 20 amemwandika mtu kila asubuhi anaviwasha washa tu hata havitumii sio ni upamu huo ni ulafi tu si, si, si uroho si ulafi ni upamu ni unguruwe huo na ndiye anaizungumzia na swala la tatu ambao mzee amelizungumzia ni swala hili kwa Kiingereza anakiita prestige ndio maana ma mwalimu alisema siku za wali tu na mzee wa Rioba atakumbuka sote tuwe ndugu wakati alipofariki mzee Nyerere sasa wa Tanzania wabunge wakasema ah si wa Kenya wanajiita waheshimiwa sasa na sisi pia tuitwe waheshimiwa hata mtu mtu akigombea tu punde tu anapotangaza anagombea sasa anasema lazima mimi mheshimiwa na akijitambulisha anasema mimi ni mheshimiwa fulani nani wewe si sisi ndio tunakutambua kama mheshimiwa na jambo la tano lilo lizungumzia ni swala la umaarufu mtu atafanya kila kitu atawaita wakina wa, wa, wa mama wanengwaji wanengwe atawaita vijana atawakodi atawa vijana vibarua na magenge la vibarua waje wacheze dansi na waite majina ya kiajabu ajabu hilo ni jambo ambalo linamfanya mwafika anakuwa na uungu fulani na hilo ni jambo ambalo unaona katika hivi alipo nanio alipojingatua kutoka mamlakani waziri mkuu wa Uingereza siku ya pili anaabiri gari anaabiri gari hivi sasa ukija katika mataifa mengi tu nyinyi njooni Kenya muone tuna watu ambao tunawaita magavana 47 nikiana nyumbani kwetu barabara kuna magari unamuona mtu na bendera na magari kumi sema sasa nani anakutisha huku nyumbani kwenu mbwembwe na vingora tu unaona mtu amelindwa na askari hamsini na zaidi sasa nasema ikiwa wewe umechaguliwa na wananchi kwa nini wanaogopa wao unalindwa kutoka kwa wanyama gani hawa wanyama walio kuchagua na vitu kava, kama hivyo ndivyo vinavyochangia mdororo wa kisiasa na mdororo wa kiuchumi kwa kuwa kukidhi vitu kama hivyo inatugarimu sisi walipaji ushuru na hivyo ndivyo vitu mnakumbuka mzee wa Riobo utakumbuka siku zile za awali mwalimu akakataa akasema katika ikulu ni kubwa mno nipeni nyumba ndogo tu msasani mtu ana nyumba iliyo na vyumba ishirini kwa mwaka hata hajatembelea moja lakini ni jambo ambalo akiwa kwenye baa na simua anasema umeliona jengo langu la kifahari si ni ujinga tu kwa hivyo kuna umuhimu wa viongozi kujinasua kutoka katika minyororo ya utumwa jinsi alivyosema three peas mzee na ni jambo ambalo ni la busara isiyo na kifani nakubaliana na msanii mwenzangu ya kwamba lazima tuhoji swala hili la mfumo umejua sisi sote watu ambao ni tishio na hatari katika Afrika ni sisi tulioenda shuleni sisi kwa kwanza fikira zetu ni za kufugwa na zimefugwa katika misingi ya kigeni na waafrika fikira zetu zinafugwa na jamii mbalimbali ukiwa tulitawaliwa tuli na waingereza kwanza kabisa walikuja wakatubadilisha majina umejua jambo la kwanza hata Mungu alipokuwa anataka kubadilisha ukiwa Abraham anakuita Abraham Ukiwa Sarai anakuita Sara. Sasa sisi kwanza kabisa ukiwa Mkristo wewe ukiwa jina lako ni Nyakulinga wanakuambia lazima uwe John. Ndio jina lako la Kikristo. Ukisha kuwa John ukienda shuleni unaambiwa kihaya ni lugha duni sasa elewa Kiingereza. Na mifumo sasa ukiangalia katika taasisi nyingi tu kinachofanyika ni ya kwamba ni fikra hizo za kufugwa. Wewe tuangalie ligusia swala hili la wachina. 
Kwa nini wa China sijui kama katika chuo kikuu cha Dar es Salaam kuna taasisi ya Confucius? Wana maono ya ajabu hawa. Katika kila chuo cha Afrika kuna taasisi ya Confucius. Kwa kuwa kile ambacho wanataka kufanya ni kupa, kutupa fikra za Kichina. Na hivi sasa sisi ambao tumeenda shuleni ukimuuliza mwanako sasa ni lugha gani unataka kuisoma kwanza ilikuwa ni Kiingereza, Kifaransa na Kijerumani, sasa ni Kichina. Na katika siku za usoni sote tutakuwa wa China wadogo wadogo. Hata tukienda kubatizwa utasikia mtu anasema mimi ni Deng Xiaoping nyakulinga. <laughs> Umejua swala hili nalisema nalizungumzia kwa utani. Kumbukeni ya kwamba wachina walikuwa na sera fulani ya kusema ya kwamba wachina hawazai mtoto kuzidi moja. Sasa wamebadilisha wanasema wanaweza wakawa na mtoto wa pili. Na nilisema ya kwamba huyu mtoto wa pili anaandaliwa. Huyo mtoto wa pili ndiye atakayefanya katika nchi za nje ikiwemo Afrika. Mimi na waenzi sana watu hao kwa kuwa wanatambua ni kitu kipi wanakitaka na wanakifanyia kazi. Sisi wa Afrika jambo la kwanza nasema na kusisitiza ya kwamba tunahitaji mikutano minne kule ya Disababa. Ya viongozi wote tuna taasisi wakilishi wote na katika mkutano wa kwanza Swala mama iwe ni kitu kipi kibaya. Tukisha li chokoza hoja hiyo na kuidadisi tuwe katika mkutano wa pili. Tuseme baada ya kutambua kitu kibaya tutalitatua kwa namna gani. Na mkutano wa tatu tutatua kwa njia gani na wanne kwa muda gani tukifanya hivyo kwanza tutatambua ya kwamba kuna makabila mengi tukisema ya kwamba wa Afrika tuungane atusemi ya kwamba tuwe na mila na desturi zetu tuzitupe nje tunasema laash wa yoruba wae wa yoruba tu wa haya wae wa haya tu wa kongo na wawe wa kongo tu lakini tukumbuke ya kwamba vitu tunavyo vitaka kama wa Afrika ni sawa Mwafrika nataka chakula kizuri tu. Si mwalimu ndiye akasema ya kwamba uh, vijana uh, ni kuwa na siha mbo, bora, malezi bora na, na, na bongo kali. Kwa hiyo jambo la kwanza tunataka kula vizuri. Tunataka shule nzuri. Tunataka miundo msingi na miundo mbi, mbinu nzuri tu. Tunataka tuwe na maostali na mazahanati nzuri. Hivyo ndivyo vitu ambavyo tunavitaka. Tunataka tuwe na ajira kwa vijana wetu ili kijana wa Tanzania akipata fursa katika nchi ya Liberia iwe ni rahisi kwenda huko. Umejua katika nchi za Ulaya kilichoko ni ya kwamba vitu vya msingi ya viwasumbui. Kijana kwa kadri kijana ambaye ameletelewa katika nchi ya Norway akisema ya kwamba kula ni ya kwamba alikula sosiji mbili tu. Lakini mwa Afrika akikuambia sijala kwa muda huyo mtu anasononeka hajara hata maji hana na ninakubali ya kwamba vitu hivyo vitashughulikiwa tukiwa na taasisi ambazo zinalenga mila na desturi mwalimu Nyerere kasema ya kwamba wacha waingereza na waamerika waende katika sayari za mbali sisi wa Tanzania na waafrika tufikishe maji ya bomba kwenye miji wacha wao wawe na ndege za kiajabu ajabu sisi tuwe na chakula mezani hivyo ndivyo ambavyo tunavihitaji hata na katiba zetu hizi tunazozizungumzia tuangalie na kubaliana nawe ya kwamba lazima tuwaulize wananchi washirikishwe na inawezekana hivyo na tukikutambua hivyo itakuwa ni jambo nzuri tu Mwenzetu nitamjibu kwa lugha ya Kiingereza kwa kuwa anatoka sehemu za Nigeria. I agree with you. If you listen to me very carefully, it means that I'm conflicted. There was a time when I thought 
And I, I'm still not clear whether my thoughts are clear on this point, that term limits are a good thing. I think no matter how good a dancer you are, you must leave the stage. No matter how good a dancer you are, you must leave the stage. And I think, and Mzee Wariobi, I'll come back to you because you are there. When Mwalimu wanted to leave office, there was no shortage of people telling, Mzee Utatuwacha Mayatima. And Mwalimu was clear that this is the time to leave. You must know when to leave. In fact, the best time to leave is when people say they want you to stay. And I am conflicted in the case of Yoweri Kaguta Museveni and Paul Kagame for historical reasons. Rwanda has come out of a very difficult history. And for that reason, the institution, the personal presence of Kagame has been very useful. But I now hold the view, and I said it in Rwanda the other day, that this should be the last term of Paul Kagame so that he can even have a puppet so that people get used. The mere fact that people see another face is good enough. It demystifies power. And I think that that is a good thing. There, President Yoweri Kaguta Museveni, with whom I have had a conversation and raised the same question, I hold the view also that this should be his last time. In other words, there is a sense in which they have overstayed a little. They have overstayed, there is no doubt. The reason why I have a problem with President Mugabe is because he has stayed for too long and institutions have suffered. In the case of Uganda and Tanzania, there are economies that is, they are worth talking about. There is no economy in Zimbabwe. You go there, it's the first country in the world that does not know which currency to use. At one time they were using the yuan, at one time they were using the rand, at another time they were using a bond, at another time they were using the American dollar. President Mugabe was a great man, an intellectual, but he stayed for too long. No matter how good you are, if you stay for too long, you spoil it. A good dancer must know when to leave the stage. That is why I'm partial. And it also gives me an opportunity to say something about General Buhari, about political hygiene. General Buhari inherited a very difficult country. And I want to say Niger the day Nigeria wakes up, Africa will never be the same again. Nigeria with a population of nearly 200 million, 300 million, Nigerians cannot even agree on a census. They don't want a census. Because they don't want to discover that the Fulani are more than the Yoruba, or the Yoruba more than the Igbo. They think that that discovery is a dangerous thing. So Nigeria must make a decision. And I think that President Buhari is unfortunate that he's, he's unwell. But look at the short time that he has been there. Nigeria, the budget of Nigeria is going to be financed by the money which was looted by individuals. You can see the fight that is coming out there, but it's not going to be easy. In fact, he said that if you threaten Kumbukenia, Kwamba, Mafisadi, Niwatu, Ajabu, they have the patience of vulture, these corrupt individuals. They wait for you. So Nigeria is beginning to move in the right direction. But once again, you remember last week, the Odudua Republic, which is the Yoruba speaking states, gave a warning that if by October, the Igbo still continue talking about Biafra, they shall be expelled from all Yoruba states. The northern states also said the same thing. That is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for disaster. Ethnicity, and I'm using this occasion to overextend my answer by also giving South Sudan, John Garang Dimabior. Right now, if you go to South to Nairobi in Kenya, all, if not all, but a good number of cabinet ministers in Sudan live in Nairobi and their children are either in Nairobi, Addis Sababa, or Kampala, or Europe. South Sudan is a hunting ground whether they where they work on Fridays, steal money, and invest elsewhere. That is not leadership. Now people are fighting the Nuer and the Dinka in the 21st century. 
One is saying that it is possible if we do what we did. Suppose President Kiir were to have weekly meetings with Vice President Riek Machar. They would resolve all these things because the people are always helpless. I can't agree with you more on, on that particular. And I think the last question is Swala Hili la Kuhodhi Marifa and National Ethos. I think there is not a single leader in Africa who spoke about a national ethic. There is an example that I've given. It happened to me when I used to come to Tanzania every other time with Jukwala Katiba. So I used to come every week. So one day I'm at the airport in Dar es Salaam and I have my little bag and they, I wanted to have it on as a carry-on bag and they told me, no, you've got to check it in. So I went to a young man who was selling padlocks. And I said, I'm Tanzania, I'm in Kenya. I'm in Tanzania. I'm in Tanzania, but I'm in Tanzania. So I said, 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 I'm in Tanzania. And you know, I keep on telling that because the attitude of the average Tanzanian about Kenya ni akwamba ni muizi. And I ask Tanzanians, Kenyans, what do you think about Tanzania? And they say they are polite and too slow. But it's better to be polite and too slow rather than to be a muizi. So that is the perception that we created. And it was created because Nyerere had ethos. One day I'm in Tanzania and a young girl, um, I asked for a soda, Coca-Cola. Coca she came back 10 minutes later with Sprite. I just laughed and took the soda. <laughs> and the moral of my story is that when you come to hostility, Kenya is number one. A hotel industry, we do very well. But I was so amazed by the politeness with which, he, if it was said, the Kenya would say, we kunywa soda wewe. <laughs> the difference is Nyerere created a national ethic and ethos. Your typical Kenya will say, nataka maji. In Tanzania, sema, ndugu naomba maji. We sometimes we joke that even the Tanzanian policeman, when he wants to arrest you, he says, Naomba ni kutia nguvuni. How can you omba to be tia, to tia mtu nguvuni? Unamtia nguvuni? And I'm saying this in jest. Mwalimu Nyerere was talking about ethics. And today, when you look at Azimio la Arusha and the ten points, is that not what everybody is talking about now? All these takukuru, all these anti-corruption authorities, all these integrities, we have gone back to Azimio La Arusha. And I'm saying that there are things there that we can look at and begin to inform our leadership. And lastly, I want to talk to young Africans. I see young Africans here. Professor Mlama, the VC, the DVC, Mzewa Ryoba have done their bit. This is a relay race. The question is, and I know that there are Christians here, if you look at the Bible, there is a man called Simon. When he had been told that Christ has been born, he said, now I can die, because I know Christ has been born. Can this generation say that of you, that now they can die? Can we leave Tanzania in your hands? Will it be safe? Or you will want to make it the 52nd state of the United States? <laughs> that is the question. And even those of you who are from the Muslims, many Muslims here will know the great Hadith writings of Abu Huraira. When the Prophet had been poisoned and he was dying, the comfort of the Prophet is that he had his Sahabas. You who are here, are these your Swahabas? Will they sell us to Europe and America? The question is yours. Choose you now. The Chinese have chosen. They are coming here. 
and they will be here. There is a phone that I acquired recently called the Techno. In the next five years, out of every 10 phones, nine will be Techno. China knows what it wants. Do we, we are 1.3 billion. Do we know what we want, Sisi wa Africa? How in the words of Nyerere, tunabaki kushangana kuduatu. I know it can't be done. When I listen to you, who is an artist, and I know you are either below 30 or below 35, I was refreshed. The former president of Sierra Leone, whom I did not like for many things, but I liked him for one thing, he said that in Africa, a journalist with a pen in his hand is like a warrior with an AK-47. He can use it to protect or to destroy. Africa is a fragile continent. What Europe and America can withstand having gone through different decades of civilization and civil wars, sometimes the multi-ethnic African communities cannot survive. The artist in Africa must be a lot more careful. You must use the tweets a lot more carefully. You must use the Facebook a lot more carefully. You must use all those mediums a lot more carefully. Because in recent history, we have seen the radio being used to cause genocide in Rwanda. So you, the artist, remember what Shakespeare said. Oh, you giant, oh, you lion, you have the powers of a giant, but use it carefully. Because he who is powerful, must know how to use the power. So you African artists, you must choose what to say and what not to say. In other words, without compromising your freedom, you must choose what to say. Just like when you are reporting a death, when you are telling me that my father is dead, you don't come and say, Mzoako, ah, yule, ayuko tena, amekufa. No, you come to me, and say it differently. And I conclude with this example, there are two ways, those of you who are Christians, of passing on information. There is the way of John the Baptist. John the Baptist was shouting to Herodias, oh, you adulterer. And ultimately, he was arrested, and Salome asked for his head, and that is the end of the story. But there was another prophet in the Bible called Nathan. He went to David and told David, Oh, King David, there is a man in your kingdom who is very poor. He has only two goats. And there is another one with a lot of goats. But this one with a lot of goats he has taken from the man who has only one. And David said, Who is this man that he may be punished? And Nathan said, King, that man is you. <laughs> you must make a decision on how to say things. The only young man whom I would have loved, please, to ask a question is that young man who raised his hand throughout and was never recognized. Yes. Hey, Karibu. <laughs> Thank you so much, Professor. My name is Joram Kumbi. I come from AOLF, Africa Youth Leadership Forum. And I've been in Kenya attending the National Prayer Breakfast fourth time, meeting the president of Kenya, Uhuru Kenyatta. So my question is to you, what have made you special? And what moves you forward as a professor? Because I want to become like you. You have said life is a relay race, handling the baton to the next generation. And if you allow me, because you are the true son of Africa, I have a gift for you a map of Africa, and thank, thank you. you for painting our hearts green. Thank I you. have a gift for you, Professor, if you allow me to Please. give you. Please. I didn't know he had a gift for me, so that did not be thought that... <laughs> Before I go back, I want you to bless me. I want you to bless me, sir. Thank you. 
I was, I was very troubled because his hand was up throughout. And this is what I keep on telling younger people is this, that this is generational. I started hearing of Mzeo Arioba when he was a judge, he was a prime minister, many things, and I kind of liked him even before I met him. And there is a sense in which there are certain ideals that he stood for. In fact, there were four Tanzanians that I loved. Of course, Mwalimu was on a different scale. I loved him in a different way. But Edward Sokoine, I loved. Mzee Warioba and Salim Ahmed Salim. And of course now, I've become a mkereketu wa John Pombe Magufuri. <laughs> but I can't agree with you more that one of the questions that I now ask when I sit on interview panels, I ask this question deliberately and I'm normally allowed to ask, have you ever made a mistake? Many interviewees actually say no. And when they say, no, I don't proceed. And when we remain to retire, I say, don't pick that one. Because my next question is, if you've made a mistake, what mistake was it? Then you tell me. Then the third question, what did you learn from it? Once you told me that you made a mistake, this is what you learned from it, invariably, you get to know that that was the best candidate. And I tell younger people, when you look at others who are older than you, borrow some of my good habits, Don't, not the bad ones, and strive to be better than me a hundred times, and you will be great and greater. And you do what is right, and remember what Mze said, the five Ps. In fact, I dare say Mze, I'm going to print this thing and place them in my office so that I may remember at all times never to be a victim of power, never to be enticed by property, never to be victimized by prestige, never to be enticed by popularity, and never to be subdued by pomposity. God bless you.